my name is Jan Linksweiler. I'm here with Sven Markus, my colleague, and we are from, from Braunschweig uh, University of Technology. And uh, we are here to present you our HPC workflow. And um, unlike you, we are not in the fortunate position that we have central groups for RSEs at the universities, but we were fortunate enough to get some funding from the German Research Foundation uh, to gather up with other people from our university in the SureSoft project to help us and help others uh, by developing an infrastructure to support their ongoing research software development. Next slide, please. So uh, Sven asked me to not waste too much time on slides, so I jump right in. So your and our task as an RSE from the highest level of abstraction is probably to deal with complexity. And due to Moore's law, there is nowadays, there's a lot of complexity that we have to deal with. And uh, Frederick P. Brooks divides complexity into two parts. There's the essential part that comes from the research problem that we try to solve. And this is something that we cannot get rid of by any means. We have to deal with it ourselves. But on the other hand, there is also accidental complexity. And that's all the complexity that adds upon this essential part. Where, what kind of complexity is this? Uh, you have to master a programming language. You have to master the build process. In our case, you have to master HPC systems, the terminal, everything, et cetera, et cetera. But this is something that we can reduce. So the idea of SureSoft is that we have a twofold approach. On the one hand, we need to educate people in order to know the paradigms of programming really well in the best possible way to deal with the essential complexity, to manage the software structure, to build efficient architectures that are evolvable over time. You all know this. And on the other hand side, we want to use tools essentially to automate all these parts that can be automated in order to reduce human error. And that's where all these tools come in, like version control, uh, continuous integration, and all this stuff. I'm not going into the details of the first part, but just one slide, no, one slide above. Uh, we have this workshop series that we built upon uh, the carpentries, the basic skills, and uh, all this code refinery stuff that you can listen to. But then there is also additional things that you can take from or learn from software engineering, like design patterns and solid principles. Maybe you've heard of those. That's how we try to educate people to deal with the essential part. But nowadays, uh, today, we want to focus on the accidental complexity. And this is an overview of the, the infrastructure that we built up. And we will focus on one part here that is essential for what Sven is going to show you. And that is the integration of the continuous integration, sy uh, int integration system with, with our HPC system. Because the integration with the HPC system has a couple of challenges. Let's keep it that way, challenges. Um, first and foremost, you have to configure your runtime and everything in order to uh, run it always in the same way to make your results reproducible and comparable to earlier results. Uh, you have dependencies to the hardware and to the software stack that you use. Uh, all this makes it hard to generate re reproducible results. And also you have uh, dependencies to tools and software libraries that you use. And the integration from the continuous integration system to the HPC system somehow is a little bit tricky because, of course, you have to uh, know all your credentials to make it run there. And all this is something uh, that we try to figure out how to solve. Next slide, please. So the tools that we are going to look at, or in this case, Sven is going to show you, is, of course, GitLab, GitLab CI, but also uh, containerization using Singularity, and then a tool that he developed, which is called HPC Rocket, which builds up the connection between continuous integration and the HPC system. And then, then we have also Field Compare for regression testing uh, to compare the results with our previous results or analytical results. 
So um, the pipeline looks like this. We have a build process um, using uh, NEPC where we run the, um, where we build the container or the images uh, to run within Singularity. Then uh, HPC rocket is used to run the simulation on the HPC systems. And afterwards we will compare the results using field compare. To uh, generate the con containers or the images, we have a two stage system. Uh, first, we build a container where we, um, where we install all the dependencies that we need to run the build to create the actual, uh, the actual executable. And then we have a, sp a specific image that is a little bit uh, uh, smaller, so the transfer doesn't take too long, where only the dependencies are involved that you need to execute the binary afterwards. And this is then done with HPC Rocket. And HPC Rocket mainly uses SSH because that's the uh, system that you usually find in an HPC system. So HPC Rocket sits above SSH and copies all the images and the files to the HPC system, then uh, schedules the job in the Slurm scheduler, waits until it's executed and pulls the system. And in the end, if the results are there, it will get your results and run, run uh, field compare to compare the results and then display all your results within the continuous integration pipeline. Field compare takes the results, compares them, and then, yeah, as I said, the results are there. So um, without further ado, I now hand over to Sven uh, to walk you through this and show you how this works in action. Okay. So I hope this is fine. Um, okay. We are going to get our hands dirty. So Jan talked to you and told you all what all about what our uh, workflow looks like. And we are going to implement it for a small example application. So what we have here is in our file tree, we have this directory here, Laplace2D. This is a small C++ application. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, is that better? Even more. Okay. Good enough? Okay. Uh, so we have this Laplace2D directory here. Um, we don't really need to know any details about how the application works. Just know that it's a C++ application and that it's built using CMake. And in order to run it on a cluster across different nodes, um, it uses MPI, the message passing interface. Uh, but that's all we need to know about the application itself. Um, this is the one we want to build uh, and deploy in a container and run on the cluster. And we want to compare its new results against some reference data that we already have here in this reference data directory. It's just a bunch of numbers. Uh, not really interested in the details there. Um, just know that we are using this as a, re as a reference. Okay, and then we have this shell directory and this contains most notably this Laplace job, um, which is all the configuration we need in order to run this um, application inside the container on the Slurm cluster. So this script will not be executed in our CI pipeline, but on the Slurm cluster. Um, if you're familiar with Slurm, you recognize these as batch comments here. Um, the most important, one, uh, most important ones are that we want to run on one node, um, and we are going to use four tasks, four processes on that node. This command here is quite interesting. So as run is the command we use to start our application using Slurm. But more interesting for our case is this part here, the end, which is where we start Singularity and we run the Singularity container. And this is going to start um, the Singularity container on the cluster. Okay, so, but that's also, of course, not we, what we are going to focus on today. Um, we are going to start with our Singularity definition file. Due to time constraints, I've already provided the finished file here and we'll just go through it a bit. Um, are you all familiar with Singularity or are you completely new to it? Who's, who's new to it? Who hasn't heard of it before? Okay, a 
quite a few people. Um, so con Singularity is a container technology. It allows us to store all dependencies and the application and the necessary files that we need inside this container and deploy it to some other system. And we define these containers using a definition file, which we have here. So we start our script or a definition, definition file with the bootstrap command. And in this case, this is just going to tell Singularity that we want to download our base image from the Docker Hub. So the official Docker registry for containers. And we are never building containers entirely from scratch. We are all, always basing them on some other uh, image so we don't have to set up everything ourselves. So in our case, we decided to use Rocky Linux 9 um, since our cluster that we are going to run it on uh, also uses CentOS and Rocky Linux is more or less the one uh, Linux distribution that's still compatible to that. And if you remember the slides, we uh, talked about that we are using a two-stage build to create our container. And this is the first stage, um, which we declare by using the stage keyword and we are calling it build. So just this is just the name that we are can freely choose. So in order to build our C++ application, we of course need to get the files from our local file system into the container, since containers are entirely isolated. So to, what we are doing is inside this file section, we are taking the directories from the Laplace to D folder and copying them onto the, uh, onto the container file system. So the first part here is the uh, path on the local file system, and after the space is the path on the container file system. So with the files present in the container, we can install all the necessary dependencies to, uh, that are necessary to compile the application. And we, are, we can simply do that by installing the development tools here that includes a C++ compiler. Um, we of course need MPI, we need to install that as well in order to compile it. CMake is our build system. And then we use this final command here uh, to call CMake and compile the application. So this will create a build directory where the, um, where the final executable will be located. And yeah, so to, to, to summarize, the file section allows us to copy things into the container. The post section will be executed at build time and any command that we specify there will be used to build the container. In our case, it compiles the application. So the second stage is where we want to run our container. And we also choose uh, Rocky Linux as a base image here. We call this stage the runtime stage. And we use the file section again here, but a little bit different. We specify the previous stage um, as a starting point. So by specifying files from build, we can copy directories or files from the previous container build stage into our new container. So in this case, we're just taking the build directory that we created when we compiled the application and copying it to the same location in our new container. And in the post section, we just need to install MPI now. So, um, this, of course, reduces the size of the container um, a lot because so container images can get quite large if you have a lot of dependencies in there. So we try to use this multi-stage build process to reduce the, overall, reduce the overall size of the container. And then the final command we have here in this uh, script is the run script command, the run script section that um, that specifies which application is going to be executed when we call singularity run, as you've seen in the script here. So this is what's going to happen on the Storm cluster. It's going to call singularity run and it's going to execute our Laplace application um, as specified here. Okay, and do you have any questions about the script so far or how to use singularity? Um, Okay. So nope. far, there's no questions in Slido also. Oh, okay. In that case, what we can do is uh, I'll simply, oh, okay, something went wrong. 
Let me quickly jump out of that again. Okay, so what we are, what we can do now is uh, I can show you how to build a container locally. And okay, interesting. So we can simply build a container by calling Singularity and using the build command with the fake root option. Usually, usually to build containers, we need um, elevated user permissions, but Singularity, Singularity comes with a handy uh, option to call fake root uh, that allows us to build containers without root rights. So we are going, going to do, use this. And what we need to do is specify the file we want to create. So we are going to create a singularity.sif, which is short for singularity image file. And as the second argument is the definition file that we are going to use for that. So singularity.dev, the one we have here on the site. Just hit enter and hopefully everything works. It starts building. This is gonna take a while, so I'll Put it in the background. Um, what we can do is, um, in the meantime, is we can write the GitLab CI file that will allow us to build this um, image in our CI pipeline. So in case you aren't familiar with GitLab CI, it's like composed of stages and jobs. And a stage can have multiple jobs. In our case, it's just one job per stage. So we'll start with a build stage. Uh, later on, we'll need a simulation stage where we are going to run the um, container. And we'll end with test stage where we are going to uh, compare our new results against our reference data. So our first job is, just as I said, we are going to build the singularity container. So let's just call it just that. So this is just the name I can give my job. And I need to specify a stage for my for my job so and this is of course going to happen in the build stage and our um, GitLab CI pipeline runs using docker containers so I can specify a docker image that is going to be used to run this build stage and in our case we are going to use um, the singularity image also we are going to use a docker image that already comes with singularity installed uh, I think this should be enough. I think this is the right tag. Okay, so, and, oh, okay, this is not sufficient. Okay, let me just click it. Okay, we need to specify the name of the image, and because this image is, would start singularity right away if you try to run it, we need to override the entry point with an empty command so that uh, the GitLab CI pipeline is actually in charge of what's happening inside that container. Okay, then let's move on to the script command. The script is um, actually what's going to happen inside this GitLab CI job. And what we want to happen is actually just the same thing I showed you on the terminal before. So we want to build our singularity container uh, by simply using singularity build, we are taking our, um, we are wanted to be called singularity SIF, the final image, and it should be built from the singularity definition file. And that's all uh, our job needs to do. Of course, um, we want to run our simulation later on in a different job. And since uh, the Docker containers are entirely isolated, this image would be lost if we didn't specify anything else here. However, GitLab CI allows us to use the artifacts uh, section here um, to specify files that we want to keep around between jobs. So in our case, this is going to be uh, our singularity image. So we are keeping that around. And uh, then we'll need to add some tags. Don't worry about this. This is just something we need in order to run uh, on our uh, local uh, CI pipeline that we have in Braunschweig. Um, so we need these two tags. This helps GitLab CI select the proper 
GitLab uh, runners that are going to be executing this job. Okay, and this should be enough to get our GitLab CI pipeline up and running. Uh, if we go over here, this should create a job just like this here. If you click on the pipelines here and see this, this should so be the result. This a little bit larger. Oh, can we make it a bit larger? Small. Yeah, this more. Okay, this maybe a little bit large, right? So this is what, okay, it's a bit laggy. <laughs> okay, so this is basically what would happen if we had a look at the logs uh, that build this container. And in the end, uh, you can see here that we have job artifacts and we could download it, but of course, other jobs can use this artifact as well. So let's go back. So this is what we are building in our CI pipeline. Then now the question is, how do we get our Slurm runner to actually run it? So the thing is, your local HPC cluster is probably not going to allow you to integrate your CI pipeline directly on the HPC cluster because that usually requires some kind of extra permission and they'd have to manage it for you and usually they don't want to do that. So um, this is why we came up with, with HPC Rocket, um, which is a simple tool that copies all your stuff on the, onto the CI, CI cluster, uh, not the CI cluster, the HPC cluster, runs your job there and then collects back the results. And uh, it can be configured using a simple configuration file called Rocket YAML. And if we edit that, nope, open it. Okay. So things we need to do in here to make this work is we first need to specify a house. So how do we connect to this, uh, to our HPC cluster? And in my case, I have already um, provided some environment variables that contain um, the address of our um, HPC cluster in Braunschweig, as well as my user. So HPC Rocket will allow you to fill in uh, environment variables here. It will allow you to um, add a private key file. Um, for authentication, so private key, okay. And this is basically all we need in order to log onto our HPC cluster. Uh, sometimes you have uh, some additional restrictions uh, when it comes to connection because it's behind a firewall or something. In that case, even though we don't need it here, we could specify a list of proxy jumps uh, that would allow us to hop between uh, different machines to get to the final cluster, um, simply with the same host, user, and so on structure as we uh, did up here. But we don't, don't need that in our case. So what we do need, though, is to copy our singularity image to our HPC cluster. And this is where this, this copy section comes in. And we'll choose the from keyword and we are going to copy over our singularity image to rsecon singularity sif. Okay, and in case we already have an overlay version there, we can choose the override command and set that to true. We also need to copy our uh, shell directory over to the cluster. So we are going simply copying over this, uh, everything over like this. And let's also overwrite everything in case we have something uh, older over there. Okay, and this is how we get all our necessary files to the cluster. And then of course, uh, we also want to collect the results back in the end and 
we can do that by doing the same thing in reverse. So we, we decided to call it collect. And the things that are in the from section here now are the path on the HPC cluster. So what we can do, so our Laplace application will create a folder called results. So we can simply take this results folder and copy it to a local results folder and allow it allow us to overwrite this as well in case we have all the results. And yeah, this is basically all we need. And yeah, so in, in case you want to do some cleanup, you can also uh, provide a list of paths that we want to delete on the HPC cluster in the end. So let's clean up our RSEcon directory. Okay, and then of course, the most important part is still missing. We need to tell our Slurm uh, cluster what kind of script to run. And this is going to be the uh, script I showed you in the beginning, the laplace.job.shell uh, script. Let me quickly check the path if that's correct. Yeah, it is. Okay. Sven? There's, there's also a question on Slido, oh. or there's actually two questions, but maybe uh, we come to one at a time. And uh, the, the one question that I think is relevant for this very moment is, does this uh, system mean that anyone with repository access can execute code on the HPC cluster as the automation user? Uh, what does it mean that anyone... Yes, it means that, yeah, but um, of course, um, so it depends. Yeah, if you if you have access to the main repository, so we solved that at our university by uh, having people fork the main repositories and um, having to go back to, to merge uh, and uh, only being able to, to get their code into the uh, main repository by merge request. So, um, yeah, so of course you shouldn't maybe give access to your students to this repository if you're concerned about security or something. Um, yeah, okay. And I think we come to the MPI question later on, right? Uh, yeah, we can, we should probably save that for later. Okay, so. Um, so if I have done everything correctly, I should be able to execute Singularity now, uh, HPC rocket now on my machine here. And um, so I already have installed, obviously, but uh, if you want to install it, HPC rocket is a simple Python application. So you could simply install it uh, with pip. So pip install HPC rocket. But I already have it, obviously. So uh, what I'm going to do is HPC rocket launch. Launch. Uh, I'll provide the watch flag, which means it's going to wait until the job has finished on the Slurm cluster. And I'll provide the configuration file we just wrote. Uh, oh, let me quickly check. I think we haven't saved the file. So it saves that. Okay. Let's see if I have done everything correctly. And if not, you just have to trust me that it works normally. The ping to the cluster was quite significant when I tested it. So let's see if that even works. Looks like it's gonna take a while. So yeah, maybe I'll just show you the log on the on the CI pipeline. Nope, I see, I see the pipeline. So this is what you would see if everything was cor correctly. Is that large enough? Probably not. So, ooh, okay, how about that? Um, first copies the file, then launches, launches the job. And you get uh, continuous. So if you if you run it in your local terminal, you can get continuous updates uh, about your job right there. It's uh, just a table that will update all the time, letting you know about the 
uh, steps in your job. Yeah, okay. All right, so uh, then let's move on. We only are lacking two short things here. We need to run our HPC rocket job in our GitLab CI pipeline. So run simulation, let's call it, create a new job for that. Uh, we'll run on the latest Python image since HPC rocket is a Python application. So we already have pip in that image. And it's going to be the stage simulation. And of course, we need the singularity image, so we need to add a reference to the previous job, the build singularity container. So let's copy that. Okay. And then we have the before script. This is going to be going to be executed before we run the before the actual job runs in the CI pipeline. And what we are going to do here is simply installing HPC rocket. And well, then we are going to run it. The same as I've just shown you on the terminal. And okay, so then run HPC rocket, uh, launch. We watch it and uh, we're going to use the rocket yammer. Okay. And this is it. Okay, all that's messing now is actually our reference, uh, our regression test. So let's assume HPC rocket runs just fine, uh, returns our results. So be before we come to this, there is two oh. more questions. Oh. One is actually a comment. So uh, the second one, so then does HPC rocket essentially spin inside a CI runner waiting for the job to finish? If Yeah, uh, it will. What if the what runner if... times out? GPU queues can be very busy. Yeah, that's actually uh, one of the problems we haven't quite solved yet. Because, so GitLab CI has an after script. However, it doesn't run if the, if the job times out. So that's like an issue in GitLab CI that's been, that has been open for like four years or something. But they haven't really solved that yet for some reason. Or have they have actively decided against it. So yeah, in case your script times out, then you probably need to um, stop the jobs manually. That's unfortunately something we haven't been able to solve yet with the current GitLab CI. But if anyone has more experience than us and uh, knows how one could still achieve that without using AfterScript, then I'm happy to hear it. And that there's a comment regarding the last question. Uh, private keys and CI variables in GitLab repositories are only available to maintainers, not developers, as long as you mask yeah. CI job outputs. Yeah, that's true. So you can, let me quickly show this to you. Um, if we go to our settings here in GitLab CI and CI CD here, or so continuous integration, you have this section here called variables, and those are only uh, available to the people that uh, main, yeah, to the maintainers or owners of your repository. So other people could not uh, see this if I don't really print them out. So yeah. Uh, unfortunately, GitLab CI can't mask the private key, which is a bit of a problem uh, because it's, I don't know, maybe it's too complex or something. I don't know, but uh, I can't for some reason select a uh, mask on that on that secret. So that's probably the answer to the last question that was just popped up there, but now there's a new one. Uh, if the job runs out and we resubmit in a second, or at the second time, will it start again from from the start or from whatever it stops? So if you restart, it, oh, it will. Uh, currently, um, it will start a new slurm job then. So yeah, like if you, I mean, if you uh, can configure your own application, I I don't know if slurm support even supports continuing jobs. I don't know uh, if it does. Uh, I'll have to look into it. Maybe I can support it with HPC Rocket but I haven't had a chance to look at that yet. 
So yeah, but uh, currently HPC Rocket will start a new job. And if you want to have any kind of continuation, you will have to manage that on your application level. So, so maybe before we come to the last part, uh, the comparison in, in terms of regression testing with field compare, uh, there is still the open question with MPI, which is actually one of the yeah, very interesting so yeah, so aspects here. Uh, what's the question? So how do you do with an MPI either on the host? That might not be the same as in the container. Yeah, that's um, a bit of a problem and probably more or less the current limit of portability when it comes to container uh, containers. Um, yeah, so what we have here in our example here is the so-called hybrid approach uh, of Singularity that I believe gives you, so that means we have an MPI installation inside the container that communicates with the MPI installation outside of the container. I think that's a bit more flexible and a bit more portable than uh, the other solution, which so, are like- So maybe the, we can, or you can explain that there is three different ways of how to deal with MPI. Yeah, MPI two, two different ways, yeah. So yeah, we have two different ways, the hybrid approach and the, um, what is the bind approach? Um, so as I said, the hybrid approach is we install Singularity in, uh, no, MPI inside the Singularity container, and it communicates with the MPI outside of the container, which may result in a slight performance decrease because of the overhead. The other one is uh, simply use the same MPI that you have installed on the host machine inside the Singularity container and mount it in, into the container. So it uses the MPI from the, from the host machine that of course is less portable because you are now dependent uh, entirely on the MPI that is installed on the host machine. And you may have to compile against that exact version. If you use the hybrid approach, you're maybe losing a bit of performance, um, but at least your container is still portable across different, different machines, although there may be, there are probably some limitations, at least the same major version of MPI or something should be used probably uh, as, on the, as on the host machine. Okay, um, are that the question? What about the terminal? Can we see if it runs through now? Your, oh, okay, your maybe an HPC off. rocket. Oh no, it's still not connecting. <laughs> yeah, I think the, I think the, Ping for some reason is way, like way too large. Maybe something is wrong with the network, as I said. So our, our HPC cluster is uh, behind a firewall in Braunschweig in Germany. And uh, I'm not entirely sure if the connection from here is, even though I'm in a VPN entirely uh, up to date and uh, if it can run over that. So yeah, um, anyway, let's, I think we are running out of time, so I'll have to quickly get to the last, oh, we have five minutes, okay, uh, to the last part. So uh, we ran our application on the cluster now and we should have gotten some results back. Um, and now we want to compare them using a, another Python tool called Field Compare uh, that was created by a colleague from Stuttgart, Dennis Gläser. Um, and it's quite useful. It can compare all kinds of file formats and um, yeah, tell you if something has changed. So we are going to run on a Python image again. And we obviously we need the results from the simulation job. So we depend on that. And before our actual job run, we will install field compare using, oh, using pip. And then what we can do is actually call field compare and we want to compare two files. The first one is our file in the reference data folder, reference data. So 
and for the second one I'll have to cheat because HPC rocket didn't work here so I'll have to check inside my repository oh no I can't um what it's actually called uh you know what we'll just use a fake name for now so we call it the other file so if field compare had worked, we would have another file we could compare it now uh, against now. And yeah, so basically this is uh, how we use field compare. And yeah, it'll show you the differences between the files. And uh, if there are significant differences, uh, it'll, it'll throw an error. So you can use it as a test tool. And there are all kinds of settings. You can um, set the allowed deviation between a bunch of numbers. And yeah, and maybe I can show you the logs in our CI pipeline so that you can actually see what it looks like if you use it. So let's see that. Right, oh, this is what it looked like. So it would read like the two files, compare the, all the kind of different fields here in there. So it works with ABS files, I believe CSV files, um, and, and any file. It uses mesh I.O. under the hood, if you're familiar with it. So it can support, uh, support all kinds of uh, file formats. And um, so anything mesh I.O. supports, uh, field compare supports. It's also extensible to new file format. So it uh, comes with a scripting API that you could also use if it doesn't uh, support your file format yet. Um, and you could then extend it with your file format. Yeah, and this allows us to run regression tests with our old, with our new data against some reference data you know, to give us more confidence that we didn't break anything. So, so Sven, if I'm hooked now, uh, where can I find more information about all this? Ah, ah good, good question. <laughs> so, the let me let me quickly open the slide. Okay, so we have like. Can get in touch here. So we have a website, Shores of Dev. We also have a matrix, a matrix channel um, where you can find us and talk to us about anything. And um, we have a Zenodo community and a mailing list. Uh, of course, we also have a group on our local GitLab uh, installation. Yeah. So and uh, as Jan said, we are also giving workshops about various topics. So in case you're interested in any kind of these topics, feel free to reach out to us and uh, we'll gladly help you learn more about those. Okay, thank you.